pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm, as Tyler, before you go, I'd like your help, actually. Um, I'd like to make sure that we answer questions you have about entrepreneurship. There's, I could talk all day about entrepreneurship and stuff, and I could talk all day about adventure stuff. But what I've learned is that entrepreneurship is about 20% mechanics and about 80% attitude and mental, the mindset. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm going to talk mostly about the mindset, but I want to also make sure we use your time the way you want. So Tyler, can you help write down any questions on the board so I can make sure we get them answered? What questions do you guys have that you'd like me to hit on today about being an entrepreneur? No questions? We're done. Okay, yes. Yeah. Major challenges that arise. I'm sorry? Major challenges that arise. Challenges. Facing challenges. Okay, good. Next one. Yes? Uh, how quickly you can kind of strain through your ideas to identify which ones aren't going to work, which ones could work, which ones you think will work, so you don't waste time chasing something with problem. So would you call that product development or would you call that decision making? Product decision making. Decision making? Okay, we'll talk about that. Yes? What's an experience that molded your way of thinking or your mode of operation? That's big time. First slide, we're going to talk about that one, okay? Would you repeat that one? Or is it, we're going to hit that then. Yeah, just an experience that molded his mode of operation, his way of living. Yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Um, from an adventure standpoint and from an entrepreneur standpoint. Yes? So I'm sure you know, I'm kind of delegating the lease startup. By, yeah. You know, stand for what people use yep. a lot, and you talk a lot about kind of validated learning and things like that. So I just would like your kind of take on how to learn from quickly from things that you That's it. okay. So that ties in a little bit to decision making too, but learning and uh, sort of that growth mindset. Yes. Um, mine would be uh, how does as soon as time you get your business going, how you uh, build a culture or uh, a system so people, I don't know, because I know one problem with being an entrepreneur is like they're always so obsessed or so really passionate uh, about what you're doing and you never can find someone that, I don't know, really gets it or cares. So how do you build a culture where people can kind of care, build that value that they see in the business? So I'm going to talk about leading teams and I think that ties into culture. Culture is super important and you can find it early and it ties back to your mission and purpose and purpose being key. So I'd like to tie all three of those together if I could. Yeah. What else? Yes? I think along with that, I'd like to see how you get people to trust you as a person and your brand and like your way of doing business. Like how long does that take to get people to trust you? That's right. Sales is the transference of trust. And how do you do that both um, quickly and in a way that is long lasting and creates evangelical customers that are willing to espouse your vision. Not always easy. Yes? Um, kind of the same line of thought as that one. Uh, ways of finding good investments and convincing other people that you're also a good investment. Okay. Does that make sense? Just... So who do you think investors bet on? Do you think we bet on the technology or the entrepreneur? The entrepreneur. Yep, absolutely. So there's part of your answer right there. but. Um, uh, and even tying in the trust back to how you raise capital and all that. So what's your question specifically? Specifically, what are the traits of a, of a good venture? Does that mean, what are the traits of a good venture? Okay. The traits that investors are looking for in a good uh, in a venture. Okay. All right. Got it. Thanks. Anything else? We got a lot. Yeah, good. How to find a successful exit strategy. Exit strategy. Wow. Okay. You're already on an exit. We're <laughs> about an exit. <laughs> All right. Angel investors love to hear that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, very good. All right. So, if we answer those questions, would that work for everybody? Yeah, go ahead. Opposite of that, like, how do you get, like, expert, like, finding basically you're starting out, like, if you don't have, like, computer skills or engineering skills or those kind of things, like, how do you put a team together? Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about those kind of things, but. Like, no, absolutely. In fact, we used to do, we call them um, uh, date nights, but we as angel investors would host 
uh, the business school, the engineering school, and the computer sci guys. And the computer sci people were typically the, like the hot girl at the dance. And <laughs> everybody wanted to become code for their particular project, right? But you kind of do need to build a team, and you need to bring it together, and they need to align who's the vision guy, I forget, or the team, I think the gentleman over there. But this idea of pulling a vision strong enough that it engages the team, and they want to be a part of it, and they want to follow, uh, and that they believe in you as the CEO or the entrepreneur of the team. Does that make sense? We call it date night. We did. We called it date night. We threw out pizzas and and uh, just let them advertise it. We brought the schools are always siloed. The computer side guys don't talk to the business guys. Don't talk to the the girls in engineering, whatever. And so bringing and breaking those boundaries down allowed the synergies to formulate. And so we did that a lot. And that's how um, we uh, got a number of companies launched. Yeah. Uh, what things to be aware of and to look for when looking at partnerships? When maybe partnerships would be a good idea and then maybe a bad idea. Maybe it would be better to just kind of head things on your own versus getting involved with someone who has an equal partnership. Okay, so to some degree, that's, you know, could go lots of places. When do you bring on an equity partner, how much do you give them? That's the tough one to answer because every situation is different. But it goes back also to decision making and thinking about it that way. Um, yeah, anything else? Okay, good, because we got a lot. All right, so I'm going to throw a little bit of adventure to get us talking about the adventure mindset. And um, the first slide, in fact, can we turn these front lights out somehow? Okay. <laughs> okay, Apple TV is not wanting us in slide presenter mode. Alright, try that. How's that? Okay, so what I'd like to talk about is the adventure driven approach. My perception my experience has taught me that a lot of people, and particularly millennials, are somewhat risk averse. Your parents taught you to be safety and mindset and all of this. And so I'm going to break down some of those paradigms. In fact, I'm going to start with a slide that says, and a premise, that says, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Do you believe that? Do you really? Who, do you know who said that? Helen Keller. She never climbed a mountain. She never sailed across an ocean. Her mindset, though, was about growth and stepping outside of her comfort zone. Rather than staying and playing in our little sandbox, the ones we define for ourselves, the ones we think we're capable of, this idea of constantly pushing boundaries and whether it's adventure or whether it's business, it doesn't really matter. It's the same mental mindset. You all are capable of much more than you give yourself credit for. I didn't learn that until some, I had accomplished some gnarly adventures and some other things, adventure races and, and going for 500 miles on foot and bike and stuff like that. And all of a sudden I realized, whoa, my body can do this, my mind can. I had stepped outside of my sandbox and made a sense of forward progress that I never thought possible. And I'm going to share some more of that with you. I first saw Everest on a business trip. I was in India and I flew up to Nepal and I chartered a little plane and was circling the mountain and I'm like, I have no construct of how to climb that mountain. It was so far and so beyond me, I couldn't even think about how that would come together. But an interesting thing happened. Within a few years, I started to put myself in the picture. And there I was, as I inserted myself and I said, instead of this wish, it became an idea, what would I need to do to go climb Everest? And this idea of, what's your Everest? As you all think about whether it's starting a business, or whether you're dealing with completing your education, or whether you're thinking about how to uh, relationships or whatever, we all have an Everest. 
And to lock in on that with a sense of fortitude and perseverance is really what it takes. I obviously had to go train. I grew up on the ocean in New Jersey. I moved to Utah from Silicon Valley. I had to learn what the mountains were all about because I couldn't find an ocean. And so all of a sudden, I started looking for bigger and uh, mountains to climb, and I ended up uh, taking off to climb Denali up in Alaska. So it's 20,000 feet. Denali is actually colder than Everest. And something happened on there. We started out with um, six on our climbing team. And I'm on the red on the right. And these guys are all a whole lot physically stronger than I am. Um, some of them are like Marine Corps tough. Some are New York firefighters. And I'm like, I make Ethiopian mar marathon runners look good. <laughs> and, and I just didn't know where I fit. And I was in the mountains, and they all seemed more comfortable. We had to drag these 60 pound sleds up to 14,000 feet. And um, we, then we, after going for 10 hours, we built these wind walls with ice blocks. And we cut up all these uh, ice blocks to protect ourselves from the storms in, in the tents. And then something interesting happened. All of a sudden, one by one, these guys started to drop out. As the weather got colder and things started to go awry, all of a sudden, you could look at these guys in their eyes. You could say, wow, you can see that he's not going to make it. He might last another day or two, but he's not making it to the top. And all of a sudden, this mental anxiety would set in, and all of a sudden, man, I don't know about the weather, I don't know about my gear, I don't know about this, and then all of a sudden, they start complaining about back pains, or leg aches, or whatever. And so there was a connection between the mental physiology and what was going on in their bodies, and it was all accelerated due to stress and struggle as we were dealing with uncertainty. One of the biggest things that entrepreneurs deal with is uncertainty and ambiguity. So you have to build a reservoir of comfort in who you are and what you're about so that you can plow through all of this unknown and deal with it and hold your sense of self and purpose together. And particularly when you have a team that's looking to you and they're wanting to make sure you're okay. Are people with me on this? Okay. The next thing that happened was we got to 17,000 feet. And by now, it's just my buddy, my climbing partner, Steve, and I. And we get stuck in a storm for six and a half days. Steve is completely altitude sick. He won't eat. He won't get out of a sleeping bag. He's throwing up nonstop. He is one mess. And I'm there trying to figure out how do I deal with all of this. And um, it was very interesting as because of the storm, we couldn't go up, we couldn't go down. Um, we, there was no helicopter to call or anything like that. Fortunately, uh, we had a chance to uh, get through all of that and make it to the summit. Three months later, he dies riding his bike at age 46, and I decided to go climb the seven summits to see if I could do it and to honor my friend Steve. So off I go to Everest. Nepal is very entrepreneurial because nobody hires anybody. You want to see what a milk truck looks like? There it is. Okay. Very poor. $400 a year average salary. We get flown into the high country, go for an 11-day trek in a base camp. And we see all these porters carrying these loads into the back country. And we realize there are no cars or trucks. Everything goes on somebody's back or a yak. These are young girls, 10 and 12, and this old lady on the left carrying loads up the mountains across these bridges to promote commerce at the UN bill. And we get to, and we realize that part is good. Carrying this load is probably 150 pounds easy. And this guy is super wealthy with five yaks, and he's still carrying the load. It never gets easier, no matter how successful you are. We get to see some great map, uh, mountains in the Himalayas and also the, all the, the monuments to the people who died on Everest when you start to realize that maybe this is pretty intense. 17,000 feet, we're in the base camp 
and we're having a, a puja ceremony to uh, climb the mountain, and then we start facing obstacles, which is the number one thing that entrepreneurs do. We constantly look at the challenges in front of us, and to make sure that as we face those challenges, there's this sense that we can do it and just go after it. This is called the Kumbu Ice Fall, where everybody dies on Everest, or the most people die on Everest. Um, they've had about 50 deaths in the last couple of years here. Um, so you work your way up there in green, working my way through, and we actually go up at night, in the middle of the night, and have a uh, headlamp and work through it because the ice is more stable. During the day, it can move up to 15 feet, and it just tumbles through that gap. The next challenge we had to face were crevasses. And to think of these, you're going across on aluminum ladders, the same kind you have in your garage, and you've got boots and ice axes and crampons, and we're working our way across the little ladders up and that's my idea of shoots and ladders, by the way. Um, <clears throat> some of these crevasses get pretty big. Here's one with five aluminum ladders lashed together. And as you step on their right foot, you see how the whole thing twists and the wind's blowing, so the whole thing is pretty rickety, and uh, you work through that. The next challenge, which nobody told me about, was going from the shaded area into the sunny area. This is maybe minus 10, minus 20 degrees, and once within an hour or two of being in the sun, if you look at the watch, you see it's 100 degrees. <laughs> Complete reflector of it, and you don't want to bring a lot of water, so we're completely dehydrated, trying to get up to 23,000 feet. And you just have to dig deeper than you've ever dug before to make it. And we had time limits that we had to meet or we'd be cut from the summit team. When you get to camp two, you've given up all the comforts of base camp. You're now living off canned sardines. And you know, your stomach's not digesting right because you don't have enough oxygen. And you look up at the west shoulder and you can't even see the summit and it's sitting up there over a mile vertical uh, on top of you. And so the next challenge is to get up what's called the low sea face and to go up here. And I'll zoom in to give you an idea how big that is. And you can just now start to see the climbers working their way up the low sea face. And there I was with the west shoulder of Everest over there. You get up to camp three, we had a huge storm come in wiped out all the tents, we had to go all the way back down to base camp and start all over again. And that was my emotional low point. Entrepreneurship has its highs, it has its lows, we go up and down, and this idea of having a process of daily recovery and renewal is really important. I was on Everest for 51 days, and there's no way you can sustain that by just kind of grit, you know, toughing it out. Um, you have to go through this, allow your human emotions to, to bend, and allow your process to rebuild yourself physically and emotionally between each of these challenges. I watched the movie, uh, Finding Nemo, and of course the motto is just keep swimming, but that was a very cathartic part of my daily uh, recovery. From 26,000 feet, you then have to work your way up the rest of the way, and you, the real climb starts. We had to pass some climbers, this is in the middle of the night, as we went up to the balcony. And at first, I was really grateful because these 50 Indonesian climbers were cutting steps in the snow, it's a soft, sugary snow. And I'm so grateful because they're saving us energy. But then I realized that they were holding us up. And on our radios, our guide said, got to break loose from the safety line, unclip from the safety line, and get past all these guys. Well, we're going up a, a, a slope like this, and in the middle of the night, with no safety line, we had to get past them. They ended up getting stuck at the Hillary step, ran out of oxygen, all kinds of problems. What I learned from that is, as an entrepreneur, you have to carve your own path. You can't follow the crowd. You're going to be stuck following and keeping or maintaining the status quo with your peers. So you have to have enough courage to fight with your convictions to make them go your own way. There I am with all my oxygen on. You can see the south summit behind me. 
Um, if you don't think it's cold on Everest, there's the camera. We took these pictures with actually. Here I am crossing from the south summit to the Hillary Step, and you can see um, there's kind of this little ridge line, nice edge ridge. And by just off to the, my right of my right hand is a 10,000 foot drop, and below my feet is about a 6,000 foot drop. And so you realize you do have to play risks and deal with risks and manage it in a way that keeps you um, exhilarated and yet at the same time you don't take undue risk to get there. There's, I'm going up the Hillary Step, teamwork and helping me to understand which of these lines I had to connect onto uh, from years past and then making it up on what's this, called the Summit Plateau where you can see the prayer flags in the distance. Now this isn't all that far, but it'll take you 20 minutes to get there. You can see I'm kind of hunched over, and I'm sucking wind. Step. Like every time I do that, I start hyperventilating. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that guy in the red got there, sat down, he wasn't in any of the summit photos, because uh, he couldn't stand up. You uh, celebrate getting to the summit, you honor your friend Steve and your family with little mementos, and then you have to make a political statement. So I got out the Utah Valley University flag, <laughs> and I planted it on the summit of Everest. Because I wanted Utah college students to know that their education will take them anywhere they want to go in life. And it's a true statement. And if any of you are questioning whether you can finish your schooling, Come see me. Track me down. I want to know if I can help you because it's that important. I wish we had more time. All right, that's the view from the summit of Everest. 22 minutes, and it's time to go down. 83 percent of the accidents happen on the way down, and at the Hillary Step, I slipped, and for about 10 seconds, I'm hanging from this little rope with 6,000 feet below me, thinking. <laughs> I'm glad I'm on a safety line. I went on to climb in Russia. <clears throat> Relatively easy to slope up, beautiful <coughs> climb. We get to the summit, we're all like, yeah! Look at us. On the way down, we get into a whiteout. And this guy, who's a 260 or 70 pound Russian guy, <laughs> the head of the Russian Climbing Federation, is telling us which way to go. And all of a sudden, poof, he's gone. He completely vanishes. And he's fallen 40 feet into a crevasse. We spent the next four hours trying to extract him from this crevasse. The team that was here was not the team that pulled him out of that crevasse. Trials and hardship will forge a team together in ways that you can never think possible. You want to talk about building a culture, an organizational culture? Throw them into the furnace and see what comes out. Give them a sense of purpose that's beyond themselves. At Cisco, our mission was to change the way the world lives, works, and plays. And now I had to learn. But that was our purpose for what we were doing and rolling out the internet around the world. The opportunity to take on a higher purpose will enable you to do so much more than you ever thought possible. Here I am in Indonesia climbing the uh, tallest mountain over there. I'm going across the Tyrolean Traverse to get to this summit ridge line to get up to the summit. Don't be afraid to take risk. Be more engaging when it comes to opportunity, as you balance opportunity versus security. We had to solve problems all along the way. For me to go 14 summits and 14 C, uh, sorry, 7 Cs and 7 summits, without that, we had to constantly problem solve and, and mitigate not only the variables that prevented me to get there, right? You're looking and focusing on what it takes to be successful, but at the same time, you're pushing aside all the variables that can come in, those laws of entropy that can get in your way, and 
making sure we can manage those on the side to keep blazing forward. And obviously that was one of them. You have to enjoy the moments. Sometimes we get our heads down in business too much, we can't see the forest for the trees, and we don't always celebrate the sale or the moment that is so special, as so I was enjoying my sudden summit in Antarctica. I also didn't lose my momentum. Too many people hit a milestone and then they pull back. I went on and cross-country skied to the South Pole, and we're going to see what the sound is like when it comes up. So we don't have sound tied to the. Let me do just a little bit. Can we turn that up somehow? Anyway, that's uh, uh, what it took to get to the South Pole. I still had a team at home, and so after doing those adventures, I decided to uh, manage things a little differently. We have a handicapped daughter. And while she was still portable, we decided to go sailing around the world, so we ended up buying a catamaran. When we took off from France, I sailed across the Atlantic and sort of had some on-the-job training. We got to the Caribbean and took my family around and saw some of the nice, easy sailing in the Caribbean. And then all of a sudden, we had to dig deep and decide whether we were going to head across the Pacific. And the Pacific is big. There's no... Uh, hardware stores, there's no marinas, it's all on your own. And so I had to decide whether my wife, who by the way, his brother drowned, and so she had a real fear of water, we had to go through the Panama Canal with our peers and simply cross the Pacific and island hop. So we did that, we had a great time, um, got to Galapagos. Um, I won't tell you this story, but that's a big fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, some amazing places. Here we are in the Marquesas and uh, exotic uh, islands all throughout the South Pacific. But I had a lot of uncertainty to deal with. Here I am. Sorry for the music. Uh, hundreds of sharks in. Uh, um, but discovering unknown lagoons and trying. I just had a good friend whose boat hit a reef and sank in uh, near uh, the Tahiti. And um, the stress of managing that whole situation is very much like when you're an entrepreneur, you are carrying that monkey on your back of always having to make things go forward. We uh, had a wonderful time with the, the, the locals. Here's a school bus, in case you didn't recognize it. Um, we should paint it yellow, I guess. Um, I, I thanked Finding Nemo, our Nemo, for helping me on Everest. And I got to do a lot of underwater stuff, which was a lot of my fun. Well, one of the fun things that I got to watch is the transformation that my wife went through. Her name is Kim, and she had to really step outside her comfort zone to go sail across, spent nine months in the South Pacific. And so the idea there was, as she faced her fears and started with maybe two life jackets and snorkeling in three feet of water, to hear where she's having a whale reach right next to her, that was an amazing transformation to see. And as you take on those and embrace those challenges in your life, you're going to have a greater sense of your own self, and that confidence will carry with you, and your teams will respond to that. So as you set a vision, and set up the strategy and engage the team to come together and execute on that vision, all of that will enable your success. So we made it to Australia, I kept sailing through the Indian Ocean and I completed a circumnavigation. From there I decided I was going to sail to Antarctica and learn from people who've gone before. And that's what we do with uh, Lean Startup, it's what we do with Nail It and Scale It. We learn from those who've gone. And guys that had done these old sailing ships before Gore-Tex and what it was like. And I wanted to experience that. So there I am working on the rigging as we're sailing across the Antarctica and getting to experience uh, what it was like working through the, the, the ice pack and visiting the locals down there. <laughs> um, we had leadership challenges and crew challenges and all the dynamics of human emotion under stressful situations. But one of the things I'd like to share with you real fast is I've learned that leadership and entrepreneurship 
have a very common parallel. Leadership is about um, bringing people towards your vision or personal helping them with personal transformation. Entrepreneurship is leading people towards a mutual value proposition. You can be confident that you don't have to sell people in kind of this uncomfortable way. What you're doing is you're building trust and then you're presenting a mutual value exchange. If they don't walk away from the transaction feeling that they've gained, then it's not a win-win. And your job is to create those win-wins and help them understand the value of that win-win in order to make them uh, feel comfortable. We had to work through the whole ice pack and down along the coast of Greenland as I did what was called the Northwest Passage. And finally, I decided to race across the North Pacific for my 7th sea on, on this boat, Visit Seattle. And um, uh, I had a great opportunity to face storms like you would never believe. 110 or 115 mile an hour winds, non-stop, one storm right after another, 40 foot waves. In fact, these are 40 footers back here, and these are 25 foot waves hitting us from the side. We were getting just this, we're in this washing machine basically. But there I am thinking this is the most amazingly far out thing I've ever experienced. And so, in one sense, I had a smile on my face. On the other hand, it was one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. We were on watch for four hours, off watch for four hours. 29 days, freezing cold, we never got warm, um, we we're constantly soaked in wet. The crew, there's no heat on these boats, they're stripped down race boats. They said, oh, I'll just wring out your long underwear, wear it, and uh, when you get in your sleeping bag, it'll dry out. Well, guess what? I don't have enough body mass to dry out my long underwear. So I just sit there and shiver, and you can <laughs> see the wear and tear on my face. Um, but one of the things that we did was, was these waves built up, or these giant ocean swells. We would turn our 33-ton, 70-foot sailboat into a surfboard. And we'd go flying down these waves at 40 miles an hour. Catching a wave will enable you to be much more successful. When I graduated in the 80s, I caught a wave that was the defense industry taking off in the Reagan era. And money all over the place to go do cool stuff. As I looked at the 90s, I thought, you know what? I don't think it's about defense. I think it's this thing called the internet. And I was able to re-architect my career and catch that wave. And I rode the internet wave. And then I looked at Utah and I thought, you know what? Utah is ripe to blossom in its whole tech sector. And as I saw the companies from California and what was going about to happen in Utah, I moved to Utah to help shape that tech sector in some way and move that forward. Keep an eye out for those waves in your industry and where technology is going and your opportunity to catch that. It isn't just about a job, but look for opportunities where you can gain a mentor or you can gain an industry that's moving that will create opportunities for you. Would you like to see a two-minute video on what it's like on that sailboat? Yeah. Think about teamwork, organizational culture, and think about the dynamics. No, it's fine. Oh.
Um, experience versus entrepreneurship. I can't remember what else was tied to this. Anybody remember? Is there yeah. I think you covered it. It was basically to give some experience in your life that kind of molded your way of thinking in your life. Yeah, so I'll even give you an early experience. When I was a little kid, I um, had a tree in my backyard, a maple tree. At first I couldn't even reach the lowest branch. And then slowly I grew and I could climb up it a little bit. And, and then through that process, I learned to trust my grip over my fear of falling. And it was that constantly exercising that. I talked about buying that sailboat at age 10. I, I actually was too young to have a paper route, so I collected newspapers in my little red wagon, and I got $6,000 a ton for recycling center. And I was an entrepreneur, I didn't even know what the work was. But those opportunities just to go out and put yourself out there, with whether it's the guy with the milk truck and you know, the bicycle, and whatever, just go do it. Be creative, have fun with it, and make it what it is. And some won't work out and they'll collapse and burn. What's the worst thing that could probably happen? You lose money, you go home, and you live in your mom's basement. I mean, it's not that bad, okay? Um, the, the reality, though, is the joy of accomplishment is so much greater than the, the sense of just staying stale and sitting on the couch and doing that. And so I encourage all of you to risk the fear of failure. Remember two things. Fear and faith are two intangibles. They're invisible. They don't really exist except in our head. So blaze forward through that and develop that experience because it's through that experience that you'll be a better entrepreneur. Growth mindset has to be part of that process. You are constantly learning. I read about a book a week. I probably, um, you know, all of that never goes away. I keep that lifelong learning and, and uh, learning lives forever. Is that the model? Um, that's all part of who you have to be as an entrepreneur. Um, leading teams, I think we kind of talked about that and the culture that comes out of that. Um, building trust. I was asked at Cisco to own the Cisco ITT relationship and manage the whole post-sale support. So I thought about how do we do this? They um, uh, had to trust what we were about. I understood how each of those managers at at and were bonused, who their families were, what they were what their goals and objectives were, as well as their overall organizational goals or objectives, so that I could come in and add value. My goal was to enable their business success. In a business-to-business -business sales opportunity, you have to enable their business success. Don't sell your widget. Enable them to be successful. In a retail or business-to-consumer model, you have to enable family success. In, in um, not just thinking, you know, I can work with a lot of internet service providers around the country, helping them understand their job isn't to provide a technical pipe to allow people to access the internet. Their job is to help families be successful with their internet experience. And that dynamic and changing that mindset aligns an entrepreneur or the organization to better serve and meet the needs of the customer to build trust, and to help that come together. Does that make sense? Uh, traits for investors want to see. I feel very much that um, it is about the entrepreneur. We're looking to see whether an entrepreneur understands their broader market or whether they've got provincial blinders on, and they're just looking locally. Do they? When they are faced with a challenge, will they be able to figure their way through the maze? And by the same token, can they pivot the organization? Because it's going to require three or five pivots before you optimize the business model. We care less about the technology, but we want a sustainable competitive advantage. But we're really looking to see whether that individual will carry that forward in a way that we can trust them with our money. 
The other thing is on investors grade on a curve. So don't take it personally. It's about how we allocate capital to um, enable us so we can invest with this entrepreneur and that entrepreneur. It doesn't mean that your idea is bad. It just means timing-wise, we like this one better or, or that this one is more relevant for what we're trying to do. So keep at it. Um, exit strategies. Um, there are all kinds of exit strategies. Dividend, was that you, I think? Yeah. Um, when thinking about exit strategy, obviously the preservation of capital early on. When you take in um, third party capital, um, try to bootstrap it as long as you can until you've validated the business model, until you really know you've got something that if you turn the crank faster, the money's going to come in bigger. Once you know you have that, then take in outside capital to accelerate your growth as fast as you can. Then, as you start thinking about exits, you obviously, as you take in capital actually, you can do debt with warrants where you preserve equity and maybe have a loan to pay back. Or you do equity-based financing where you have a shared partner kind of relationship. I would be reluctant to give up equity partner or bring that guy who asked the question until I knew they were fully embraced my vision and were willing to put as much on the table as I was. It's a hard thing to see. So do it in milestones so it's not all at once but they're besting as they've earned it and you develop your trust in them in a way that's sort of this equal um, balancing of trust and validation and all of that kind of type of stuff. Um, but the, whoever's helping you put money in will help you uh, pull it out. Um, hey, Mark. Yeah, Mark. No, that's good. I'm done. But, oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt. No. Um, I, I just I want to present this Thunderbird Award to Mark Fry, who uh, uh, came here and I think gave such, a, such an inspiring talk about investing and entrepreneurship and life in general. And so thank you very much. For